Hi there, this is Scholar Minor, a podcast about myth, magic, and occasional miscellany. My name is Ursula, I'm your host and fellow learning enthusiast. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Scholar Minor. Even though it's technically spring here in the California Central Valley, we're anticipating our first heat wave in the coming days, and it is starting to feel like summer already. This summer will be an interesting one for me, as in preparation for an upcoming medical procedure, I will have to abstain from one of my very favorite aspects of hot summer evenings, beer. I love beer, and I am lucky enough to live in a region with incredible craft breweries, and interesting new labels seem to appear almost daily. And while I can't drink it right now, I can certainly talk about it while I enjoy my sparkling water, which is almost, though not quite, as nice. So cheers, dear listeners, and welcome to the strange history of beer. The oldest evidence of beer suggests the Sumerians and Babylonians began brewing with barley before 6000 BCE. In the fertile soils of the flatlands between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, Mesopotamian peoples gathered and soon domesticated wild grains, using them to make an ancient bread called bapir. But bapir wasn't necessarily for eating on its own. It was a combination of malted barley, barley flour, and honey or dates that was baked more than once and left to dry. These hard, disc-like breads were reminiscent of hardtack and could be stored for a long period of time. Instead of being eaten as is, they were crumbled into water with more malt and natural sweetener and allowed to ferment naturally. Ninkasi was the Sumerian goddess of beer and alcohol in general, and it was she who taught mankind to brew beer, or kas. Pottery discovered in the Zagros Mountains of Iran contains traces of calcium oxalate, a deposit resulting from fermented grains. When Sumer was conquered by the Babylonians, their knowledge of beer making began to spread, and eventually the Egyptians would establish a common and streamlined brewing technique. In its earliest forms, beer was drunk from clay jars using a straw. Some of these straws have been discovered in tombs and are intricately decorated with precious stones. Even the god Osiris is sometimes depicted with one of these beer straws in hand. The Egyptians experimented with different recipes, and while some kinds of beer were brewed for specific occasions or ceremonies, everyone had access to it, from the poorest peasants to the royal family. Interestingly, the actual brewing of the beer was usually done by women, and this would continue to be the case for thousands of years. Being wine fans, the Greeks were thoroughly unimpressed with beer when introduced to it. The Romans likewise preferred wine, especially as beer became associated with the nomadic Celts and Germans with whom they frequently butted heads. These peoples had become adept at brewing over time after migrating west from the Asian continent. Grapes wouldn't grow as well in colder northern climates, but grain was fairly hardy and readily available for northwestern Europeans. While many folks looked down at beer as a sorry substitute for wine for many centuries, it found new life in the 5th century in the hands of the monasteries. Take a look at the beer aisle in your local grocery store and you'll notice the influence of monks and monasteries on beer making even today. Not only do they feature prominently in names and on labels, some brews are still produced by functioning monasteries. So how and why did monasteries become synonymous with beer? By the early medieval period, most folks drank beer, children included. It was a readily available source of calories and nutrients, and as it was fermented, could be stored. You may have heard that beer was so widely consumed because water was generally unsafe to drink at that time, but as it turns out, that's actually a myth. 
While it's true that in densely populated areas, water was often polluted due to poor sanitation, most early medieval settlements did have access to fresh water from wells or other natural sources. Beer was preferred because it was cheap, it gave you some calories to burn during a hard day of labor, and it didn't taste too bad after the introduction of gruet. Various combinations of herbs that were used for flavoring during brewing prior to the great hops takeover that would come in later years. Beer brewing at monasteries began with the order of the Cistercians, founded in 1098 CE. This group of monks had previously been part of the Benedictine Abbey of Malesma, but left to start their own monastery in Citeaux, France. They felt that Malesma had been slacking, and that the monks there were not being held to a high enough standard of austerity and dedication. Saint Benedict, namesake of the Benedictines, had preached the holiness of simplicity and hard manual labor, so the Cistercians sought to refocus on these teachings. As part of this strict observance of Benedict's rules, they believed their monasteries should be self-sufficient and hospitable toward pilgrims and travelers. The people wanted beer, and the monasteries could trade it for food or whatever else was needed to keep things rolling along. Monks had a deep understanding of herbs, too, and when combined with their propensity for learning, monks became very efficient and skilled brewers. Soon, monasteries featured huge brewing operations alongside their gardens and animals. As it became clear that monasteries were money makers, nobles began to offer up parts of their land to the monks, hoping that the monastic community would draw travelers and consequently profit their way. Providing hospitality, a warm bed and a meal to folks on the road was a priority for monasteries and viewed as a religious obligation. Beer and wine too became part of that practice. The monks also refined their technique to produce the best brews possible. Beer with higher alcohol content was more widely sought after for obvious reasons, and the general population would pay more money and trade more enthusiastically for stronger beer. Monks started using the same mash of grain for multiple batches. The first batch that went through the mash would be the strongest, with the highest alcohol content, and would be reserved for selling and trading. The second batch wasn't as strong, but was still pretty good and would generally be kept for the monks themselves. The final batch would be fairly weak, but still contained some alcohol, nutrients, and flavor. This would be distributed to the poor to help the monastery stay in the public's good graces. Historians believe that hops was introduced to beer brewing around the 9th century CE. Though it also imparted a unique flavor, hops was unlike its predecessor Gruet in that it lengthened the shelf life of beer. This was a hugely important development because it meant that beer could be transported longer distances without spoiling. Records indicate that hops began to be grown specifically for brewing in southern Germany in the Bavarian region, which actually remains one of the largest areas of hop cultivation in the world. Hop's medicinal and preservative qualities when added to the brewing process was first documented by Abbess Hildegard von Bingham in the 12th century in her Physica Sacra. The medieval Catholic Church was not a fan of hops. Interestingly, this was not for the medicinal or folk remedy reasons you might expect. Fact is, the church had started selling gruet for beer making, and it had turned out to be very lucrative. When hops arrived on the scene, its bitter flavor and improved preservative qualities led to gruet falling out of favor with the beer drinking public. To combat this loss of income, the church began to impose beer purity laws beginning as early as the 12th century. They were largely ignored, however, and brewing took off all over Europe. And while monasteries were getting pretty good at making beer, they certainly weren't the only ones. Come whoso will to Eleanor on the hill, with fill the cup fill, and sit there by still. Early and late, thither cometh Kate, Cicely, and Sare, with their legis bare, and also their feet, hardly full and sweet. With their heels dagged, their curtels all to jagged, their smocks all to ragged, with titters and tatters. Bring dishes and platters, with all their might running, to Eleanor rumming, to have of her tunning. She leneth them on the same, and thus beginneth the game. <laughs> 
English poet and tutor to England's Henry VIII, John Skelton, published his poem The Tunning of Eleanor Rumming in 1521. A far from flattering portrait of rural life, it describes a grossly stereotypical environment of filth and debauchery. And while it most certainly isn't the most pleasant poem to read, it is very important, because the titular Eleanor Rumming provides us with a glimpse of an important role in medieval and renaissance society, the alewife. Financial independence was almost unheard of for women during much of the medieval and renaissance periods. But since beer brewing fell under the umbrella of household tasks for many centuries, it was considered socially acceptable for a woman to brew beer. It was a fairly typical gender assigned task at that time. So women started brewing beer for profit, sometimes opening small businesses dedicated to brewing. These ladies were known as the alewives. The mind altering effects of alcohol gave the alewives and their businesses a pretty negative reputation in polite society as evidenced by Mr. Skelton's poem. Drink was associated with rowdiness, sex, and ungodly behavior, even though almost everyone drank. It was a guaranteed way to make money, and enterprising women were able to capitalize on the upward trend despite society's hypocritical attitudes. In England, after the population was decimated by the Black Plague, labor was in higher demand than ever before, and women were able to take advantage of this need, carving out a niche for themselves in a male-dominated economic landscape. Unfortunately, as the industry grew and breweries began popping up throughout the European mainland and the British Isles, the dynamic shifted again in favor of male brewers. It was difficult for women to raise enough money to compete with better funded and larger breweries. So brewing businesses became large and lucrative and male owners took over, though many women were able to continue brewing, albeit no longer in leadership roles. But these alewives and their ale houses had helped to lay the foundation for one of the most important creations in the history of beer, arguably in the history of the world, pubs. The earliest roots of the modern pub lay in the Roman tabernae, or wine shops, and in the ale houses of the Middle Ages and Renaissance. In a nod to their monastic predecessors, though a bit more focused on profit, early ale houses also functioned as inns and provided meals and beds in addition to alcoholic beverages. These operations were incredibly successful. By 1577, there was approximately one ale house for every 200 people in England and Wales. By the 16th century, ale houses and taverns were incredibly important in both rural and urban communities. They became gathering places. Interesting news could be shared by neighbors and travelers passing through, schemes could be concocted, philosophical discussions and brawls could break out in the blink of an eye. But it was truly the Industrial Revolution that brought the importance of pubs and their role in communities to light. Beginning in the mid-18th century and lasting until the early 20th, the Industrial Revolution saw the birth of modern industry and mechanization. The days of agricultural timekeeping were over. Factories and urban centers needed workers, and to entice them to come and work, inexpensive housing sprung up throughout cities. Ale houses, or pubs, turned up in almost every neighborhood within walking distance. Pubs served a similar role to the alehouses of yesteryear. They were a place for news, discussions, and community. But the Industrial Revolution introduced something else too, commiseration, particularly about their new and often frighteningly unregulated jobs. Hours were long, pay was low, and work was often incredibly dangerous. Large numbers of workers were now living together, working together, and drinking together. Labor unions were born in the pubs of the Industrial Revolution. In the British Isles, Europe, and the United States, society had seen incredible technological advancements that allowed for mass production and required lots of labor. But since much of this technology was new and emerging industries had little to no regulation, large employers were able to exploit workers and do whatever was necessary, ethical or not, to make a profit. In their neighborhood pubs, workers were able to discuss problems like low pay and unsafe conditions and agree to do something about it together. While one person voicing concern to a large employer would have little effect, large numbers refusing to work until conditions improved could make a devastating dent in a company's profits. 
And so labor unions were born, and they are still incredibly important in many industries today. Labor reform was born behind the humble walls of the neighborhood pub. Prohibition in the United States put a bit of a damper on the brewing industry, and when beer reappeared on American shelves in the 1930s, it wasn't the same. Like many other things, brewing had become mechanized, with traditional ingredients like malted barley being replaced with cheaper options like corn. A lot of beer could be made very cheaply, and for a long time that was pretty typical in the States. Europe maintained higher quality beverages, though weaker beers had become fairly trendy in the 20th century. Brewers like the Trappists, a monastic order descended from the Cistercians of old, began brewing beer with higher alcohol content to combat this trend and retain customers. It worked, and still works, and brewing in places like Germany and Belgium thrived. In the 1970s, folks became interested once again in brewing at home, which would gradually evolve into microbreweries as craft beers rapidly grew in popularity. These days, there are tons of craft brewing operations. According to the 2020 numbers provided by the Brewers Association, there are currently around 8,700 craft breweries in the United States alone, compared to 4,800 in 2015 and the craft beer market is worth about $22.2 billion per year. This adds up, as where I currently live, I could probably throw $7 out my window and someone would put a pint in my hand. There are over 1,000 breweries in California, and boy, do I miss them. I hope you enjoyed our sojourn into the history of this fine beverage. I'll leave you with a little appropriate Shakespeare from Henry V. Would I were in an alehouse in London, I would give all my fame for a pot of ale and safety. As always, my references, contact information, and website are in the show notes for your perusal. I encourage you to check out my website, www.ursaminorcreations.com, and the Scholar Minor YouTube channel for past episodes and additional content. Thank you all so much for listening. Have a beautiful week, and I'll talk to you again very soon.